All right, guys, today we are going to be ranking some combat survival knives. Now, some may be asking, this is a survival channel. Why are we talking about combat survival knives? It is true, I cannot weigh in much on the combat aspect of many of these knives, but the survival aspect is something that I test heavily and am quite experienced with and have already ran many of these knives straight through that ringer. So without any further ado, guys, please don't forget to comment, like, share, subscribe, check out the Patreon, the Instagram. It is all heavily appreciated. So now let's rank some blades. So we're going to start off, of course, as we usually do with the largest of the blades and then kind of working our way down to the smallest. Now I have tried to pick a lot of serious combat knives and knives that were designed specifically with the intent of being a combat blade. And unfortunately, much to my dismay, there aren't a whole lot of knives or most people's preference is towards smaller knives. So we have a couple bigger knives that are designed to be combat survival knives. Then the most, then the rest of them are all kind of smaller. So now let's actually talk about some of these blades. So of course, getting the first two larger blades out of the way, it's going to be the Chris Reeve knives or CRK Pacific. Now, like I said, this is designed to be a combat survival knife, kind of multi-role knife. And I have modded mine to be a little bit more survival oriented, but I think that the CRK Pacific, especially after being modified, makes a fantastic survival side combat survival knife. I have pushed this knife into many uh, survival training situations and it just has proven itself very well. I will say the S35VN is very nice for corrosion resistance and it's kind of one of those steels that you don't really have to worry about uh, rusting on you if you are in wet environments. Uh, in addition to that, in addition to that, the overall size of this blade lends its hand really well to being a primary tool for larger tasks such as batoning, firewood uh, gathering, or resource gathering, and shelter building. So I think that this knife is very hard to go wrong with. Of course, you guys know this is my go-to survival blade for Alaska and for my truck. So I obviously have a lot of faith and a lot of confidence in this blade. Another blade that I have pretty much equal confidence confidence in, though less serious experience with, is the SE6. Now you guys might notice my SE6 looks just a little bit different. Maybe you didn't notice at all, but one difference I did make with my SE6 is I actually brought the edge back to 18 degrees per side. And I wanted to do that because I wanted to make this blade just a little bit more slicey. And I think the 1095 high carbon that the SE6 is made out of is perfectly capable of handling that and I think that it actually complements the blade very well. So hopefully you guys can kind of see that the bevel is brought back and wider than it was previously. But aside from that, this has been a fantastic blade that I really do love running and what's it's very similar in size to the Pacific. And I think that the ergonomics on this blade, SE nailed. Some people do prefer the 3D or three-dimensional grips that kind of fill out the palm swell more. As for me, I definitely don't mind this. I do think that the palm swell would be just fine as well, but either way you slice it, the SE6 is very, very tough to beat and coming in at substantially less money than the CRK Pacific, it's even harder to argue as far as a survival blade that is can be pushed into combat applications. In addition, something I wanna note is the sheath compatibility for both of these is pretty good. I would give it a slight edge to the SE6 because this plastic sheath can be bolted onto many different things such as packs, such as your belt and many other things. So yeah, those are my go-tos. I like the size of them a lot and I think that they're very capable as far as survival knives go. Now, stepping it down a little bit, we're going to talk about blades that are right around that four to four and a half inch mark. And we're going to talk about the first one, this one being the Bravo One by BRK. Now, the Bravo One was originally designed to be a combat knife and serve military teams very well. For me, I pretend to prefer a little bit longer blade, so pushing more into the Bravo 1.5. However, all I have is the Bravo One at this point, so uh, I will talk about the Bravo 
Bravo. I will say this blade is very, very similar to the Falkneven F1 in the fact that it is a very thick blade, but is actually surprising in its sliciness and its performance because it has a very long, very well tapered convex grind and it comes down to a very nice tip as well. Now my version here is in A2 with, uh, I believe this is green canvas micarta, but uh, you can get this in a wide plethora of options. As you guys probably know, BRK offers many blade steels, many handle options for basically all of their go-to knives. The Bravo one being no exception. So that is the Bravo one. Uh, as far as what I think about it for a survival knife, like I said, it is a little bit smaller, but a lot of these knives are similar to what most people would carry out in the field or in combat. So I think the size is appropriate for uh, like all things considered. But as far as survival goes, uh, I really do like this blade for the fact that it is very tanky, very thick, but that convex grind allows it to thin down to a very nice sharp cutting edge, but still retain a lot of the strength of that thicker blade. So essentially what that means is you can really put a hurting on this blade. You can really abuse it and it's going to be able to hold up very well, but still have a reasonably fine edge for cutting. Now, one thing like I've mentioned with the Falknevens, because this is a convex grind, you will, no, you will need to learn how to use the convex grind because it does cut slightly different than a more traditional uh, kind of flat grind or Scandi grind or even full flat grind. So you will have to learn it, but it is a pretty fantastic option. I will say leaning more towards the tactical side, they do offer these in rampless and ramped versions. Mine is ramped and I think that that's a little bit more for tactical. So if you do hold this in reverse kind of ice pick grip, you are going to get a lot of traction on the back of your palm to really lock your hand in. Something I do like about um, ramps such as this and such as the CRK Pacific, I do think that they are preferable. So we'll start talking about knives that have guards in a little bit, but I do like ramps because ramps allow you to have good traction if you need to stab into something, but they are easy enough to bypass if you need to put your thumb over it. So I'm a big fan of ramps. Like I said, the CRK Pacific has a ramped uh, kind of spine and they are not necessarily my favorite for long-term prolonged use, but they do allow a good amount of traction and the ability to bypass it to put your thumb over it for choking up on the knife for finer tasks. So something to keep in mind um, as far as the Bravo one goes, I think it's a pretty fantastic uh, all-arounder. It's very hard to beat in general. They are a little bit pricey, but it is a classic staple and pretty much the blade that put Bark River knives on the map. Okay, like I said, full guards talking about now. Now we're gonna talk about some full guarded knives. Okay, now let's talk about the Gerber strong arm. Now the previous knives I've talked about, I've all been a very big fan of, and I really do recommend the knives if they meet your applications and needs. The Gerber strong arm, I kind of feel mixed about. This isn't a hard no for me on this knife, but this knife is designed to be a tactical field blade and tactical survival knife and to that end, I think it does meet that goal. But as we'll talk about with some other knives that some people, more like fanboys, dislike, um, more fanboys of the Gerber's dislike, you know, there are a lot of competitive options out there for the Gerber strong arm price that offer better materials, better ergonomics, and better quality overall. So while I would say with the Gerber strong arm, if you can find one for a reasonable price, like around $50, it's not a bad knife, but it doesn't really excel at anything. It doesn't really offer a lot uh, for the price, especially being around $100 nowadays. It doesn't really offer a lot still using a cheaper steel 420 hc that while yes is a easy steel to resharpen does lose its edge reasonably fast and does not offer a lot of corrosion resistance for being a stainless steel in addition to that too ergonomics are a really big thing whether it's in tactical use or in survival use and i feel like the <clears throat> strong arm is not very good in those regards so like i said this does have more of a proper guard as opposed to a ramp so what that means is if you do try to put your thumb over this guard you're going to be running into a very sharp very non-rounded 
portion of the back of this handle that's going to be digging into fleshy bits of your thumb and make your nerves very unhappy and it's not going to be comfortable over prolonged use. So if you can just sit down and make, let's say five feather sticks really quick to start a fire, this is not going to be a very comfortable knife to use and it may impact your ability to do that task. That's why we try to find knives that are very ergonomically sound so that if you have to do tasks rep with repetition, you don't have a knife that either causes blisters, pain, or just unnecessary uncomfortability or uncomfortability. So that's kind of why I am on the fence about the strong arm. It's not my favorite. I will say one pro to it that I do like is the rubberized handle. It is very tacky, but at the same time too, it's very tacky and very temperature neutral, which is a big pro. But I will say something that I have said in the past about the strong arm is I really dislike how thin this knife feels in hand. It does not feel like you have a really good grip on the blade. So I do not recommend it if you don't already have it, but if you do have it, it's not the end of the world. Okay, next one up on the don't recommend list is going to be the Gerber. LMF2. And the LMF2 is really pitched as a survival knife or as a pilot or crew helicopter or a helicopter crew or pilot blade. It's specifically designed to be a kind of egress slash survival tool for those people who work around helicopters and aircraft in general. The problem with the LMF2, in my opinion, is the fact that it is not very well built, as you guys can see here. With my model, I have really ran it through the ringer and it has this internal plastic has really broke and shattered. And so that leaves that there are pieces of this rubber, you know, that are unsupported and kind of get damaged and flake off. And overall, uh, similar to the strong arm, the build quality and the materials used here are very low quality. And you can see it in the fact that, you know, like the handle breaks, uh, the blade itself when dull very quickly, unfortunately. And that is kind of one of the things that's like, yes, this blade may be able to be sharpened in the field easily or more easily than other steels, but it also dulls quicker. So, you know, you kind of have to weigh that as a pro or a con. One thing too I will note as well with LMF2s, all LMF2s come with a serrated blade or a combo edge only. So one thing to note, if you are in the field with a serrated blade, there is no realistic way of sharpening this, especially like this included sharpener on the sheath, which I'm not necessarily a big fan of anyways, but that certainly will not sharpen your serrations. So considering that half of this blade is serrated, um, that definitely is a big con for me. So overall, this is a blade that, unlike the strong arm where I would I feel more mixed about this blade, I definitely recommend staying very clear away from the strong arm, sorry, from the LMF2. There's really no reason to choose this blade. And once again, this blade being pushed at around, I think $120, that pushes it into the realm of knives such as the SE4. So for about the same size, about the same price, you can get something like the SE4, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. And uh, really there's no reason to choose this blade. There's no particular, you know, option. There's no real particular pros to this blade outside of the only thing that is good about this blade is it does feature a fully rubberized handle, which similar to the strong arm, it does give you added grip and added insulation from cold weather and cold environments but once again you take a massive hit in quality and even this rubber itself I found to be very soft much too soft to really be on a knife because this uh, handle is even as you guys can probably kind of see starting to like kind of flake off or not so much flake off but kind of like rub off and get damaged so it's it's not a very high quality rubber I can really speak to that because there are quite a few knives especially Mora's that use a much higher quality uh, rubber than this particular uh, knife and it they do not wear the same so I will say, in my experience, the LMF2 is not recommendable in the slightest. Um, it's just not built for survival at all. 
Okay, so let's talk about some competitors to the last two blades mentioned. Of course, I already kind of snuck this one in, but this is the K-Bar BK-18. And the BK-18 is very similarly priced to the strong arm, very similarly colored. Um, it is obviously a little bit different, but I think that this blade is a resounding yes for me. Um, there are, not everything is perfect about this blade. I'm not the largest fan of these grivery handles. They can be a little bit slick in hand, but one thing that does really help is that this knife, unlike the uh, Gerber's, are this knife, unlike the Gerber's, has a really, really solid ergonomic pattern to it, so it feels very comfortable to use and you can really get locked into it. In addition, from a tactical standpoint, the harpoon blade is definitely going to be a lot more effective in actual fighting if you need it to than the more standard kind of basic grinds of the Gerber's. And so you see this thing leaning more into actually being fighting and more useful for utility because it has a wider blade, a long grind and a thinner edge. In addition to that too, this blade also features 1095, similar to the Essies, and this, this blade is pretty darn fantastic. A lot of people are wanting K-Bar to push more into the stainless market, and I think that would be kind of cool to see something like this in S35VN. I would definitely pick it up, but at the same time too, the Crovan 1095 that they use is pretty good at performing, and it's a reliable, trustworthy steel. I mean, you know, a lot of people, you know, uh, as far as 1095 goes, you know, it performs fantastically in knives like the SE lineup. And so 1095, while far from a new steel and not on the cutting edge, so to speak, is still a very fantastic, solid performing steel. And the BK-18 is a really good example of that. Not to mention the BK-18 is also, like I said, an under $100 uh, blade that really outperforms its competition. Okay, next up on the list is going to be the SC4. Once again, this is another blade that I've already mentioned a little bit in the, in, in the list, in the lineup, but this is a really fantastic performer. It's very hard to go wrong with. Um, these blades hold up, can take a ton of abuse, and are right around that kind of perfect military survival, combat survival uh, blade size. This is another one though that similar to my SC6, I might actually end up taking back that edge to around 18 degrees. Because this is such a thick blade, I think I want a little bit more slicing performance out of it, and I think it can handle it. But either way, even if you run with the stock, I believe it's around 22 to 25 per side degree angle uh, it's pretty hard to go wrong with this blade is overall one that shares a lot of similar properties and pros of the se6 but just in a smaller package that is a little bit more manageable that's just a little bit more manageable and not to mention once again you know when you hold this thing up to its competitive options such as the LMF2, this blade well outshines them. It doesn't have as many fancy features, no built-in sharpener, but it also doesn't have any serrations or anything that could really go wrong. No rubberized handle, but also no plastic to break. So this is kind of a more bare bones blade for the price, but at the same time too, it knows what it is. It's very re well refined and you're not probably going to be able to break it. Last up on the list is one that is not a technical combat or combat survival knife, but a knife in my collection that I feel would perform very well in those applications. And that is the good old 3DK or Three Dog Knives MAK or multi-animal knife. Now, like I said, this is actually designed really more as a skinning blade, but it has a lot of similar properties to something like the SE4. Now, it being in about the same size, a little bit thinner in overall thickness, but it also has a bit of a different grind and just a little bit of its own blade. Now, the primary reason why I wanted to mention the 3DK is partly because this is an Alaskan company and I love that, but also what I think really makes 3DK's knives stand out is their level of versatility. And like I said, like I said in other videos, you can get these blades in several different steel options, several, several different handle options, and similar to the BRKs, 
And similar to the BRKs, you can really custom tailor these knives to fit your needs. Now, unlike the BRKs where they do drops of different handles and steels, the 3DKs are from the factory. You get to pick your steel, your handle option, and you can also ask them to modify it in different ways, such as flattening out the back and sharpening it for striking ferro rods, or even taking off certain hot spots or changing little tweaks. Because these are made in-house, they are customized by 3DK. So it's really cool to see the level of customizing that you can do to a standard stock uh, 3DK MAK. And you can also make it fit your platform or your needs very well. So this particular knife is made out of K110, which is kind of like a European style of D2. But you can also get this in uh, steels like M390 if you if you want higher uh, levels of corrosion resistance. And of course you can get it in uh, N690 as well. So it does offer a, lo a lot of versatility in what you want and what you're looking for in your combat blade. So that's why I kind of wanted to throw the 3DK in there. Um, there's also several sheath options available, things like classic leather like this, or as you guys have probably seen on my Desert Eagle, things such as Kydex. So there's a lot of versatility to that blade and I think it's just a really effective knife and overall one that's hard to go wrong with. Okay guys, hopefully you've enjoyed this ranking. A lot of these knives are personally some of my favorite knives. I love a lot of the knives I own, but I also wanted to mention a few knives that are pretty popular out there that are not so good, such as the Gerbers. So anyways guys, as always, God bless and I'm out.